Sourav Ganguly, fellow Zaverian, fellow Calcutan, and fellow Telegraph enthusiast. Sharmila Tego, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third edition of a lecture which is fast acquiring the status of a signature happening of the city. Two years back, the first Pataudi Memorial Lecture was delivered by Imran Khan, gentleman about town and cricketer. Those of you not present on that occasion, here is what you missed. I grew up <clears throat> admiring two cricketers. Um, one was my first cousin, Javed Barki. And Javed Barki and Mansoor Ali Khan played together at Oxford. So they were in the same team, along with uh, another Indian, Abbas Ali Beg. So the three of them were at Oxford about a decade before me. So as a boy growing up, Javed Barki was, because he was my first cousin, my family, um, we, we always wanted to emulate him. So here was someone who was good at studies and also good at sports. So this, thank God I followed uh, a, a role model. Uh, uh, otherwise I would not have studied. And the biggest blunder I would have made if I had not studied. The other, of course, big um, reason I studied was my mother. So when I was 18 and on the verge of playing uh, for Pakistan, she insisted that I, wish I would only play if I completed my education afterwards. So, of course, we had these role models. And when I, and from Javed Barki, we always used to ask about Mansoor Ali Khan. And now this is what he used to say. Now, remember, I'm a child growing up. My hero telling me, he said that if Mansoor Ali Khan had not lost his eye, he felt that he would have broken all records that such was his talent in university when, he's, when they used to be playing together. He said the, the quality of strokes he could play, um, he said mere mortals could not play those strokes. And to actually have gone on with one eye and have the sort of record which uh, Mansoor Ali Khan had, um, uh, it, it, the mind boggles what he could have done with both eyes. Last year, we managed to persuade Greg Chappell to be a little courageous and come back to Calcutta <laughs> only for this event. Here again is Greg Chappell. Fate meant that I didn't play cricket with Tiger Batori. I got close on a number of occasions. 1966, when India toured Australia, I was representing South Australia and played in the tour match. Unfortunately, Tiger didn't play in that game. He was carrying an injury that uh, he actually took into the next test match at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. I watched that test match and saw two of the most amazing innings that I think I witnessed in, in test cricket. 75 in the first innings and 85 in the second innings, carrying an injured leg and with one eye playing against some very good fast bowlers. Two shots come to mind from that test match, one from the bowling of David Renneberg and the other from the bowling of Graham McKenzie. They were certainly inspirational innings. They were played with great skill and flair and, of course, a great deal of courage. I next met Tiger in 1968 when I was playing county cricket in England for Somerset. I was injured at the time, which was fortunate for me because I got to see the last test match of the Australia-England series that year in which my older brother Ian was playing. I went up to the Oval to watch the test match and on that occasion, along with uh, Richie Benno, Tiger Patordi, uh, came into the, uh, the tent at the end of the, the day and I had an opportunity to really meet him and to, to talk cricket with him for the first time and I was very impressed with his his wit and his ability to 
read the game and he was the one in fact that predicted that uh, England would win that test match. At the time he made that comment it was a very even game but in fact England did go on to win that test match. We are delighted that Sora Ganguly is here today to deliver the third Pataudi Memorial Lecture. By the time Ganguly had put on his pads, Pataudi had already decided to hang up his. They missed playing together. One is known as Maharaj, the other was to the manner born. Both shared other heritages, not the least of which was a recalcitrant board. If captaincy to them was the art of the possible, handing the cricket board was the art of the impossible. Both were forced to give up the captaincy, but both were gracious enough. To continue their innings under the leadership of their juniors. Both were gentlemen as well as players. The feudal upbringing helped. As captains, they were both above regional ties. They were captains of India and behaved like one. Tendulkar or a Gavaskar would promote the West. A Bishan Singh Bedi, the North and an Azaruddin, only Hyderabad. But Ganguly would not promote Deep Das Gupta unless he merited an entry into the national side. Playing for India was a privilege and an honour. This was one great contribution of Pataudi. Only Ganguly, amongst all cricketers, imbibed that spirit. My friend, the historian Ram Chandra Guha, even argues that these may well be the solitary such instances in the entire gamut of Indian sports. There were other reasons to bemoan the passing of the old order. Like the gentry of yesteryears, both Ganguly and Pataudi were patrons of the young and the talented. Bishan Singh Bedi, Prasanna, Chandrasekhar, or even Vishwanath could realize their potential only because of Pataudi. Ganguly too believed in the young. Jivrat Singh, Harvajan Singh, Shahbag and Kef are testimony to Ganguly's devotion to cricket and to India. Once upon a time, the game had more gentlemen than players. Today, this sport is a victim of what the left calls a deepening of democracy. At one time, cricketers would hail from St. Xavier's or Winchester. Today they mostly come from the small towns. What was once the game of the kings now belongs to the Ahmadmi. If I am allowed my share of the indiscretion, I would say, thereby hangs a tale. The nation once speculated what lay behind the choli of Madhuri Dikshit. That too was the pleasurable part of being an Indian. Today one speculates what cricketing sensation lies buried in the white envelope now kept sealed with the Supreme Court of India. I am not a cricketing man myself. I prefer to tea rather than take stance. Pataudi once said, it was easier to face me than the West Indian fast bowler, Andy Roberts. But, this, but since the meek will one day inherit the earth, even I, one day, mustered up enough courage to needle L.P. Sahi, the indefatigable and irrepressible man of cricket on the telegraph staff. Tell me, Sahi, I said bravely, what is the one defining cricketing weakness of Ganguly? Does he have one? replied Sahi incredulously. Well, what about his penchant for chasing balls, pitching outside the left hander's off stamp and moving away? I meekly suggested. 
In the Telegraph, I am the village idiot so far as the cricketing knowledge is concerned. So Sahi rolled his eyes but kept quiet out of respect. So why not get an umpire to settle the issue, I suggested hopefully. Who? asked Sahi. What about John Wright? I said. John Wright was then the coach of India team, while Ganguly was his captain. Wright nearly fell from his chair when he heard the question. Does your editor play cricket? he asked. If he does, it is a very well-kept secret, said Sahi. <laughs> Only somebody with a profound knowledge of the game would have spotted this weakness. And do ask your editor not to write about it. I did not have the heart to tell Sahi that the one with the profound knowledge was not I, but Pataudi. He, in his turn, gleaned this knowledge in Australia when he represented India at the funeral of Don Bradman. The man with insight was Bill Laurie, the Australian batsman whose knowledge of the left-hander's craft was part of the cricket's law. I kept my promise. The national secret was not leaked. The legend survived. <laughs> now that the Dusta is out of the hand, ladies and gentlemen, I asked Sora Ganguly to take his guard for his innings. Still leg, still leg stump, I presume, Mr. Ganguly. But do be careful of that ball that seems away from your off stump. The innings is yours, Mr. Ganguly. Respected Avik Babu, Sharmila ji, ladies and gentlemen. You know, for the first time in 20 years, I've carried something to talk. I've never done it. And as you said, uh, weakness outside the off stump, and, and I very rightly agree so. Uh, it looked very good when I hit it through the covers, but didn't look very good when I nicked it to the first clip. And when I was sitting down and watching the video up there, and hearing Avik Babu speak, he said he was courageous enough to get Greg Chapel to, back to Calcutta last year. <laughs> and, but I must say, sir, you've done the right thing by bringing me this year to correct that. <laughs> okay, since, since 2007, after Greg Chapel left the country after the World Cup defeat, and I hope there are no journalists here and you're not reporting, whether it's Gautam or Sahi and whoever is there, please don't make it a headline tomorrow. <laughs> because your headlines get me into trouble, whether with the chief minister or whether with the cap coach and the captain of India. <laughs> Everyone I met since 2007 has said you were right. And it was great to hear Avik Babu trying to correct that mistake once again. When I was watching the video, and before I start talking about the legend, the great man, the cricket in India, captaincy, when I was, when I was watching that video on, on television, uh, rather on the screen here, and uh, the great Nadi contractor spoke about Pataudi not having an eye, not having a shoulder, and not having a thigh, I asked Mrs. Pataudi, that, then what did you marry? <laughs> you had someone who didn't have an eye, didn't have a shoulder, didn't have a leg, but was a fantastic player and a great champion in Indian cricket. Thank you so much for having me here. Now, when we talk about Mansur Ali Khan Pataudi, somebody who I haven't seen uh, play the game because he did it much before I was, I was born. And uh, when I started playing the sport, or when I started growing up, I, started, I played a lot of soccer and didn't have so much interest on watching cricket rather than hearing it on television. Uh, on radio, uh, because television in those days was, was not, that, not as it is today. You can watch South Africa play Australia in Cape Town. At the same time, you can, play, you can watch India playing Afghanistan in Bangladesh. So I didn't have the opportunity or the luck to watch uh, Mansur Ali Khan Pataudi play the game. But when you speak to his contemporaries, various people who have played the game with, and you saw one gentleman, Mr. Bishan Singh Bedi, on, on, on the screen. And it's not easy to get applauded by him. <laughs> uh, he will only say good to someone who really, really has to be good. 
And I must say, Mansur Ali Khan Pataudi must have been a champion to get accolades from him. He spoke about someone of Pataudi taking them to the woods and setting up everything. I remember my first camp in Bangalore in 1990. I was a 17-year-old boy, and Bishan Singh Bedi was the coach of India, and the team was touring in England, touring to uh, supposed to go to England. And I remember the Cabin Park in Bangalore, where every morning we used to be on the park running around the woods. And when I hear this on, on the screen, I can, I can understand where it came from, except Mr. Dilip Vingsaka. Because every time he would come on that uh, Mahatma Gandhi Road in Bangalore, everyone would start running and he would quietly sneak out of the back gate and get back into the pavilion. <laughs> now, when we talk about Mansur Ali Khan Pataudi, we talk about someone who was a very important figure in Indian cricket. Not many players continue to have so much importance and recognition even after their playing days are over. And here is one man who not just because of his playing skills, but also with his quality of character and class, has continued to live in the hearts of not only Indians, but also foreigners who played the game in that era. And I must tell you that all those who have watched cricket, who have been a die-hard supporter of the game and still watch cricket, getting respected by the players, the people, and, the game, and people connected with the game in England in those days was never easy. It's never easy now. It was never easy then as well. Having the advantage of born in an affluent family, and I, and I beg your pardon to read this out because he's someone who I've not seen very, very closely, but obviously someone who's, who I've heard a lot of stories about. Having the advantage of being born in an affluent family helped his cause, but that in no way took away sincerity, honesty, and capability to work hard in the game, which at that stage was a game for the elites, who would even think twice to bend and pick up a cricket ball. Forget about diving as you see in modern days. And as you're aware, he was one man who brought the art of fielding into Indian cricket. Being born in, a, in an affluent family with a massive background, you saw the pictures of the beautiful mansion, or rather the palace. To have that mindset for me was something very, very special. You know, when you watch, when you listen, or when you read about such great people, who've actually set standards in Indian cricket, and especially people or cricketers you haven't seen, haven't watched much. You know, it's certain things you pick from listening to your, the, fel the teammates who you've played with, and even by reading through various books. He was born in 1941 in Bhopal, and then educated in Aligarh, subsequently in the famous Wellam Boys School in Dehradun, Lockers Prep, Park Prep in Hertfordshire, and then Winchester College. So his connection with England and county cricket was at a very early age. There was never a doubt that he was born with a golden spoon, which I think is, is not bad in any way in, those era, in that era, something which was an advantage and disadvantage in many ways. An advantage and a disadvantage which I uh, realized in my early part of the career, and, and I was hearing Mr. Bishan Singh Bedi say that Pataudi was lazy. He didn't have a kit bag, he didn't have a cricket bat, and I heard the same thing about me as well, that he was lazy. But I was sitting next to Sharmila Ji and saying that as a cricketer, when I've, after having played so much and been through the pressures and ups and downs of captaincy as a player, it's a special skill to not have a cricket bat and go into a test match. You know, in a, in, in a modern day kit bag of a cricketer, you will see 10 or 11 kit bags, kid, uh, cricket bats. I don't know whether you remember watching Mahendra Singh Dhoni play that uh, final in the West Indies about a year ago when he had to get 15 of the last over and comes out the substitute with four cricket bats and he picks all of them and only as a cricketer you can understand he swings all of them together. It's a mechanism to get the bat weight light so that you feel the weight light and then he hit 15 in four deliveries. To actually play an international match without a cricket bat of your own, you walk up, you pick someone, someone else's bat and go, you must be a very, very confident man to do that. Because when you play international cricket, when you play at the top level, you don't want to fail. You make sure you prepare well, you have everything ready for the game, and then you go and score runs. He didn't have an eye, he didn't have a cricket bat. And to average 35 in test cricket, he must have been special. Having lost his father, Iftikar Ali Pataudi, only at the age of 11, it must have been very hard for a young man to decide the course of his career. But his tremendous love for the game took him away from the duties of the Nawab. 
He not only inherited the Nawabi from his father, but also the passion and the love for the game, as we all know that Iftikhar Ali played for England and later went on to lead India against England, something which you will never see in the modern day cricket. Mansur Ali Khan succeeded his father as the ninth Nawab and held, on, and held on till it was abolished by the government of India from the constitution in 1971. Being the Nawab didn't take him away from, cricket, from the cricket field and he was always gifted with the special hand-eye coordination which made him a batting prodigy in his early days. That he was a captain material was noticed at a very early age and he beat the record of the great Douglas Jardine, somebody who was admired massively as a leader. And I must state when I met uh, Avik Babu a few days ago, he said, you must speak about Douglas Jardine. He's, he's someone who even he has enormous respect of and, and to get noticed by someone at such an early age must have been really, really special. It was very difficult in those days, especially after 1947, to get admired and acclaimed by the British. But the Nawab made his debut for Sussex in 1957 and then played for the Oxford University and then went on to become the first Indian to captain the university. Now I know today is an evening to talk about the life of a captain, but why I'm trying to say all this is because as a common man, we all see the glamour and the glitter of a cricketer, whether it's a Pataudi or a Tendulkar or a Ganguly or a Dhoni. But behind that glamour and glitter, the steelness, the hardships and the toughness it is the thing which separates the great from the ordinary. And here is one man who with so many handicaps have achieved greatness and most importantly respect among the Indian players. He made his debut for Sussex in 1957 and then played for Oxford University and then went on to become the first Indian to captain the university and it's never an easy thing. That was, that was a testimony of his skills and quality as a player and a leader and the reason why I say this, as I said, having played a lot of cricket in England, I find, I know how hard it is for an Indian to get used to the English culture, especially in an era where the British were considered superior. Blink Playing county cricket was a massive moment in my life. I still remember the excitement of playing for Lancashire in the year 2000, when Bobby Simpson, the coach of Lancashire then, he was the coach of India in the 1999 World Cup, where I had a fantastic World Cup. And at the end of the year, he gave me a call from, from Australia saying that we would want you to come and play for Lancashire. Our coach of the Indian team then, the great Kapil Dev, tried his best to persuade me not to play the full season but I didn't listen to him. He said, there's too much of cricket going around. It's been a long tour of Australia. Go home and rest and come back fresh for the start of the new season. But I said, no, I would want to play because I want to experience that. I want to experience what it is playing a full season of county cricket. In, in the modern day, when being a part of the IPL is a massive aim for cricketer, for every cricketer, you, know, you read in the newspapers, everybody wants to be a part of the IPL team, the international players, the foreign players fighting with their board. In, in our days, when I was young, obviously I was, was also a part of the IPL uh, towards the end, but in our days playing county cricket was a massive, massive recognition of how good you were as a player and also your achievements. And this was an opportunity I didn't want to miss. But very quickly I realized that it was not as glossy as it was from outside. The challenges of playing day in, day out, it was six days a week cricket, just like going to office in England, because in England you don't earn a pound without hard work. That's the policy they believe in. So you had to play six days a week in the county circuit and more so 105 overs a day. I remember in the month of end April, it was cold in England, six o'clock in the evening standing at first slip. The professionals had their advantage of standing at first slip. And the clock, you know, sounded six times. And I looked up and saw it's six o'clock. And then I looked at the scoreboard. It still had 15 overs to go. So that how challenging was county cricket in that time. The biggest challenge for, a, for an overseas player in, in county cricket was after seven o'clock. You had to get back into the tie and suit of the English county, Lancashire. It's a county of heritage. Uh, Sussex was in the southern part of England and Lancashire was in the further north of England. And you had to be at the bar with the players. 
something which I didn't enjoy because I'm a complete teetotaler. But I still had to be on tie and suit, and, and, and every time I missed it, I was reminded the next morning I had to find excuses. You know, I fielded 105 overs, my legs are aching, I've had a long season before I came, and found out ways to get back to my wife because I was newly married then. And then I realized in a month, couple of months that I was slowly getting a bit unpopular for not being at the bar. That Mansur Ali Khan Pataudi still continued to lead county sides, was a testimony to his personality and the enormous respect among the fraternity who were considered, as I said, the inventors of the game in that era. I said before, I've never watched the great man play, but for me, the reason Mansur Ali Khan Pataudi will deserve respect from everyone connected in the game and those who understood how hard it was playing the battery of fast bowlers against the West Indies, the English and the Australian, that he not only didn't have helmets in that era, he didn't have an eye. And for me, that is the greatness of the man. And everything stops there, where he came from, how good he was, what bat he used, whether he at all used his own bat, whether he carried a kid back. It's about playing the likes of Andy Roberts and Michael Holding and Joel Garner with a hat and gloves, where if my daughter punched me, I can have a broken finger. And I think that's where he stood different from the rest. Pataudi, the fielder, everyone speaks about. Pataudi, the player, everyone talks about. Pataudi, the captain, everyone swears about. You talk about, even in modern day, you, you hear about Dhoni, you hear about Ganguly, but when you talk, when you listen to people who've been connected with the game for a long, long time, they say, it's Pataudi, the captain, and he's the best captain India has had ever. For me, what stood out for him, and imagine yourself standing in between the keeper and a bowler with someone bowling at 90 miles an hour without an eye, a hat to cover his left eye, if I am correct, the left eye which he lost, and facing a red cherry which can kill you. And I think that speaks volumes of his class, character, and he even showed that once he retired from the game. He never went back to the administrators. He never went back to the board asking for favors. And I've always stood as a man of integrity. Now, I know the topic for the evening is about captaincy. Before I move into uh, my own experiences as a captain, uh, seeing other captains, I must admit one thing before I move on to something else, that whoever did the surgery, Dr. David Clare Roberts, if I am correct, he must have done a great job. Because not only did he go on to play 46 test matches after that, averaging almost 35, which was phenomenal, with one eye, he had the eye to select, or rather get married to one of the most beautiful and the respected ladies <laughs> in recent times. <laughs> to everyone, Pataudi was a mind changer in Indian cricket. To his colleagues, as I said, he's still the best captain. And to some of the hard nuts, and I call Bishan Singh Bedi a hard nut. You know, when I was captain of India, I used to come back to the hotel after six o'clock, good day or a bad day, and I used to flick channels to get, get it out of the system. And I made sure I didn't watch the channel where I saw Bishan Singh Bedi's face. <laughs> I would keep going past the channels, and the moment I see his face, I would straight away go to the next channel. And didn't, didn't even, I was too scared to even hear what he was trying to say. And, but I must say, once I finished playing for the country, he was and is my best friend. I get regular SMSs from his wife, saying that how good a commentator I am. Probably the best, one of the best captains he's seen. And many a days, I wished to SMS her back saying that I wish he thought that when I was playing. <laughs> but I said, let's forget it. It's past and let's not worry about it. Sahi laughs the most because he's seen everything closely. For me, the biggest meaning of the word captain is trust. You know, having captained in there for 200 games, having been through an era where as, as Avik Babu said, and I don't want to say it, uh, you must have heard Avik Babu people 
talk, picking his own players. Some came from Bombay, some came from Hyderabad, some came from the, from the north. It was about the trust among your players. My first tour of 1991 in Australia, I was a 17-year-old boy, picked from nowhere. <coughs> picked for, after a, a good season in domestic cricket and straight on the tour of Australia as an all-rounder. Somehow, I always made my debut in international cricket or a comeback in international cricket as an all-rounder. And I never had much belief about my bowling skills. I remember getting on to the tour in Australia in 1991 and landing in Perth. And on the flight, Air India flight, to, which, which landed at Perth from Bombay, you know, the first thing the, passenger, the pilot said, welcome Indian cricket team, and I need to tell you that you'll be landing in Perth, the fastest wicket in the world. <laughs> and we were a bunch of Indian, 16 or 17 of us, with the greats, Kapil Dev, Venksaka, Azharuddin, Tendulka, Young Tendulka, and you name it. And I could see the faces of everyone. And I must say, we played a game against Western Australia in, 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 in Perth, and the match was finished before the lights were on. It was a day-night game, and the lights went, couldn't be switched on. India were all out for 70, and Australia finished it in 15 overs. And I remember that night, I was a young boy, 17-year-old, uh, just came down at the reception of the Perth Hotel, hotel in Perth, wasn't playing the game, and I saw one legend, an absolute great, walking down the hotel lobby and said, come, come and have dinner with me. I was starstruck watching the great man uh, asking me out for dinner. Obviously, I didn't have an answer. I had to follow. And we walked down the uh, footpaths of, of Perth. That's the advantage we Indians get when we travel overseas, that we get so much of freedom. Imagine, imagine a Tendulka walking down the footpath outside the Oberai Hotel here. And I kept walking down the footpath, went to a lovely Chinese hotel, and he ordered food. I just followed his orders. And we, ke we started talking about cricket, and the first thing he said, I should not have been on the tour. Uh, he said, I was too young. It's going to be a tough tour. It's going to be quick, bouncy pitches, fast bowlers. And I needed a bit of time to be on the tour. And I didn't know what to say. I remember that evening, even now in my life, that, and I didn't utter a word, came back to the hotel and couldn't sleep the whole night, thinking I've got to spend three and, three and a half months on this trip to Australia. And the first person in my team believes that I can't play and I shouldn't be on that tour. And for me, that was a massive, massive experience. I got left out after the series, left out for four years, and kept playing domestic cricket, not that I missed playing for India, because I remember coming back home and telling my dad, I was a 17-year-old guy, I'm happy to be back home. He was a bit surprised. He said, uh, young man, your life's about playing the game. I said, no, I'm happy to be back home and I want to get back full prepared. So this is one thing which, which I remembered in my life from day one. I never knew I would play for India. Again, I never knew I would captain India someday, but these were the words which engraved in my mind. And I, and I spoke to myself that ever, ever, ever in my life, if I get into such a position, I will never tell this to a young cricketer. We, were, we had a terrible tour, a nightmare. We lost five test matches, mostly in three days' time. So there was a lot of time for holiday and sightseeing. And, and there was one man who stood out for me on that, on that series. It was the great Sachin Tendulkar. I had the opportunity to share the room with him, and, and I must tell you, when I first landed on the tour, I was asked to share the room with a senior player, and all I said was good morning and good night for two months. <laughs> then one fine day, he was having a terrible, terrible time on that series of Australia, just being bounced by the fast bowlers, McDermott, Merv Hughes, who would get you out and keep running at you all the time. And after two months, he asked me, can I make a cup of tea for you? <laughs> and I said, uh, what do I say, yes or no? I said, yeah, please, if you can. I, I would never get batting in the nets as a young player because there were too many of them who were out of form, trying to get back into form, bad hours and hours in the nets. I was on the tour as a batsman, and in a month's time, I was a bowler. I would only, I would only pick, my, pick my boots, go to the ground, pick my boots, and keep bowling at the nets. 
And one fine day, I went, went to Mr. Abbas Ali Beg and said, sir, can I have a hit in the nets? I am also carrying a few bats. <laughs> he said, pad up. I said, fine. And I had two spinners and Abbas Ali Beg bowling at me. <laughs> so I went up to him and said, sir, do you think I have a chance in playing on this trip? He said, yeah, why not? Every 16 players have a chance of playing on this trip. I said, I don't think I'm going to get Hirwani and Kiran Morey and you to bowl, bowl at me if I'm batting at number five for India. He said, fair enough. I understand what you're saying, but the bowlers are bowling a lot. You have to be happy with what you get. So that was my first trip to Australia, but a, a trip which taught me a lot about, about leadership, a trip which taught me a lot about how to go about your job as, as a captain and a player. I came back in 1996 on my first trip, on my second trip to the tour of England. It was almost four years, and I didn't miss playing for India in those four years. A lot of, lot of people after I finished playing cricket asked me that, you reckon if you played those four years, you would have got another, another five or 6,000 runs for India? I said, no, I didn't even miss playing for India. I was happy playing for Bengal, playing with some of the big names in the domestic circuit. Bengal were a good team then, and I thoroughly enjoyed playing, playing for Bengal. I went on to the tour of 1996 and got 100 on debut against England at Lords. And, and, and I keep telling everyone that after that, I, I played about 420 games for India both one days and test matches together. I never had that mindset. I never had that, that free, unclustered mind when I went out to bat. Because every time I walked out to bat for India after that, there was something at the back of my mind, whether as a player, whether as a captain. We went on to the tour, and obviously we finished on the losing side. We never knew how to win overseas then in 1996, and uh, I had a great series, two test match hundreds, Sachin got two hundreds, Rahul was, was being sp spoken about by everyone in the world, and we came back losing. S after that, we went to South Africa, West Indies, and various other parts of the world, and the result was the same. And the reason I say this now is, is, is the period in, from 2000, when I first became captain of India, and that's when I met Mansoor Ali Khan Pataudi for the first time in, in a function in Delhi. I was given the player of the year by Sports Star, and he was present at the function to give me the award with, with Raj Singh Dungarpur in Chennai. And I met him at the function and said, uh, Sir, I've never met you before. I've never watched you play. But obviously, this is a big, big moment for me. And... Uh, I've been part of a system for nine years, watched cricket move along, cricket go back a few years, and I've been given this job to captain India. You've been someone who everyone talks about captaining India. So I need, you need to tell me one thing which will make this unit, make Indian cricket a better team to be. I don't want Tendulkar getting 100. I don't want Dravid getting 100. I don't want Azhar getting 100. I don't want Ganguly getting 100. I want India to win. He said, pick the team you want and pick the right team. Don't worry where you are from. Don't worry who you like. When you sit in that selection committee meeting, pick the team which is going to win you test matches and one-day cricket. And this is something which I remembered all my life as a captain. But he gave me that one piece of advice and didn't, didn't give me a second one. Sometimes when you ask past players of one advice, they give you ten. <laughs> and he was one man who only gave me one. Neither did I have the guts to ask him for another one. And we finished. I don't know how much talking he used to do with you, ma'am. But that evening, he just, he just gave me one advice of, of picking the right team. And I remember that till the six years of my cap captaincy, till one gentleman called Greg Chappell took it away from me. Mm. <laughs> so when I became captain for the first time, these are the two things I remember, team and trust. I had this experience of me of 1992 when, when you walk into a dressing room and they say you, you shouldn't have been on the trip. 
I had the experience of 1996 when I played fantastically. I remember, sorry, I remember coming out of the airport in Calcutta, and I've never seen so many people in my life who took me home on an open jeep. But for me, my main aim as captain of India was to change Indian cricket and get a team which won overseas. We lived for too long with the tag of individual brilliance, Tendulkar, Dravid, Azhar, Pinksaka, Kapil Dev, as I said, but they knew at the back of their mind, an Englishman or an Australian or a South African, that this is a weak side. We'll put pressure on them, we'll put pressure on them, and by day four, we'll beat them. And this is what I didn't want to be a part of. I still remember my first meeting in Kochi. My wife flew in uh, all the way from Calcutta, and Kochi was a long way those days. It's not modern day flights, where you have five flights a day, and she was asked to watch the game amongst the crowd. Luckily, people didn't know her much then and didn't recognize her. I remember, the, I remember the, my first meeting at, at Kochi, and uh, I walked into a team meeting, and I looked around the chair, and I saw some names who, who were my captains, and I didn't know what to say. I announced the team, obviously, first announcement as captain, so I said all the right things which everyone wanted to hear, although I felt that that was not the right thing, but I still had to say. And finished the team meeting in, in 10 to 12 minutes, and then asked my senior members to address the team meeting. We finished the meeting in half an hour, announced the team, and came back to my room, and I, and I told my wife that I don't think I'll be captain for too long. She said, why? I said, I can't speak in a team meeting. You know, I see players, I see great names, and I just get paralyzed. She said, you'll get better. So for me, the only thing I said in that meeting, I said, everyone's performances will be recognized. It was a one-day game, and over the years I'd seen in Indian cricket, players batting at six and seven, not getting the due. So I spoke to the players and said, for me, a hundred at the top of the order is as good as a 30 ball 30 at number six and number seven. And this is what I am going to congratulate or rather reward at every selection committee meeting and every day at the end of the game. I know you guys don't get opportunities. I know it's not the same as a Tendulkar and a Ganguly opening at the top of the order, but you do an equal job for the team at number six and number seven. And for me, that changed the entire atmosphere in the dressing room. It's about, it's about the faith and the belief you showed to people who were not stars, but who were still making a useful contribution in the team. And I think for me, that was the essence of being, uh, of being a leader. We finished the game, we, we beat South Africa. We got massive 300 and 320 and won the game. It was in Kochi, the hottest place in India. And since then, I, till the time I remained captain of India, I kept on telling the BCCI that whenever England, South Africa, Australia comes to India, please send them to Kochi. <laughs> because by the time that match finishes, three or, three or four of them, especially the fast bowlers, will be on the flight back home to their country. <laughs> I've never seen a place which is so hot and so humid ever in my life. The biggest thing for me as a captain in the life of a captain was to be transparent. To tell the players what you're looking from them and tell the players this is what you're going to get in return. And most importantly, say exactly the same thing in the selection committee. And I've seen captains who would say on the face, that you were good, you are brilliant, but I still couldn't find a place for you in the team. And invariably that leaked out. You know, leakages in Indian culture was the most easily available thing. Right from starting of Greg Chappell's email to everything you discuss in the selection committee meeting, which somehow finds the front page of the newspaper. So I realized, no, it's not Sahi. It's not, you've made a name, Sahi. It's definitely not Sahi. And... Uh, and uh, so, so that was my main target as captain. I tried to maintain that right throughout my career. It's, an, it's, it's a tough job facing a 
player facing somebody who's leaving the team because he will come with all sorts of questions. I had one Ashish Nehra in my side and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm not scared to take his name because he will not crucify me for that. Every time I left him out from the squad, at the end of the day, after captaining, batting, winning or losing, he would knock on your, on your door and say, why am I not in the team? Every day. And, and he was from Delhi, so you know how someone from Delhi speaks. He was a jat. So I had to face him at 11 o'clock in the night after the, team, after the game was over, answering him why I didn't have him in the team. And, I, and, and you know, after a certain while, I, I've, I realized that it's, it's not a bad thing to do because he comes, he screams at me. I could never imagine screaming, screaming at my captain. He screams at me and says, I need to play. I need to be in the team. And I always wanted to have that sort of people in the, in the squad who wanted to play. Not as someone, when the team was announced, would say, why me? You know, because there have been instances in Indian cricket where when you played the West Indies, when it went, went past your throat, went past your nose at 90 miles an hour, there were people who would read the newspaper and, and imagine as if they've never hurt the team. For me, the real goal as captain was, was to change Indian cricket. And, and to change Indian cricket, you had to address smaller, smaller issues which went unnoticed in the bigger picture. Now, coming back to the pressures of captaincy. You know, it's a job which, which looks very good from outside. It's a job which comes with uh, thousands of fans chasing you, being on the television all the time, called the captain of India. Most of the time you stay as captain, receiving all the endorsements, uh, although everyone receives endorsements these days, uh, somehow managed to, managing to get another chance after a couple of failures. Behind everything, there was this massive job of leading India. And... Uh, before we came into this, into this, in front of all of you, Navik Babu was uh, sitting with me in a, in a door next next to this hall, and he said there was a friend of his who said captain of captaining India was as, was probably the most toughest job in world cricket. And 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 I didn't disagree with him, and neither did I disagree with the person who said that. And it's a decision which you have to take. It's a decision in life, and I, and I don't see that with the captain of India, and I see that with every top person in every aspect of life, whether you're the prime minister of the country, whether you're, whether you're Avik Sarkar, the, the owner of the number one newspaper in, in the state, or some of you who are the CEOs and the managing directors and directors of companies and, and corporates who've made it successful. Being a leader or being a captain comes with pressure. You either take it, or you let somebody else take it. It's a decision you'll have to make when you, when you are entrusted with the job. I've seen so many people who enjoy staying in the background and say, let him do it, let him face the heat. But for me, it is, it is the strong and the desired ones who take on this job of handling the pressure of being captain. Rahul Dravid once told me something very, very special. You know, he batted at number three for India uh, since 1998. I had to give up that position because the captain somehow felt I was good at number six with the ball was old. He couldn't hit sixes, and I could hit sixes at number six. I never knew hitting sixes was a disadvantage in life, that you had to go from three to six. <laughs> but then I was pushed down the order, and, uh, and I asked Dravid on a tour of South Africa. You know, we were young in 1996, and, and we decided on a policy that let's, let's make this tour successful. So to do that, we'll work hard. And three times a week, we'll get up at 7 in the morning, and let's go and run together. So as usual, Dravid was ahead of me, that sort of a person he was. Every time he would call me and say, I'm waiting for you. I said, I'm coming. I'm in my shorts when I've just jumped out of my, of my blanket. But somehow managed to be there in five minutes' time. And I asked him that you bat day in, day out, number three for India. You bat in front of the new ball against the likes of Pollock, Donald, Klusner, Callis, uh, Makai, and Tini, all of whom bowled at 90 miles an hour. Did you once feel that what happens if, you, if you're not up to it? He said, yes, Saurav, I do. I said, how do you react to it? And he said, I think it is an opportunity. It's the way I see it. I can see it in two ways. Either I am happy batting at number six, where the ball's old, the ball is tired, somebody up the order has played a big knock, 
and I'm happy to do that role, or I'm happy to make a name for myself. Get up at number three, get test hundreds, and be remembered as one of the best players of the new ball. And for me, captaincy like life is about holding things at the scruff of the neck. Not realistically at the scruff of the neck, but addressing the issue at the, at the scruff of the neck. And, and standing up for it, because I'm a firm believer that you don't want to finish your life thinking that I could have done something better. Although I did finish my career thinking that probably could have got a different coach in 2005. <laughs> <clears throat> but, and I think for me that's, that's a very, very special challenge. And, and from that day in 1996, my respect for Dravid just crossed all boundaries. And I said, here is one man who's, who has absolutely enlightened me with one sentence of his. Although he was kind enough to say that I was a god of the offside and I kept asking him, why did you say that? He never gave me the answer then, till he became captain of India. He said, uh, you know, every time I performed, somebody performed better than I did. And invariably, his name was in the headlines of the newspaper. My debut 95, you went and got 100. So you, you were in the front page of the newspaper. My World Cup partnership with you, I got 145, played three times better than you did, and you got 183, and the next day you were in the frontline papers. <laughs> And I got 340 with Sachin Tendulkar, he got 180, and he was in the frontline papers. So I, I started to absorb that and believe that every time I do something, somebody else will do it better, and he will probably get the headlines than I did. But on a, on a, on a serious note, I think that was something very, very special, which he said, I'm not surprised why he has become the player he is, the personality he is, and the achievements he's had for Indian cricket. So for me, pressure. Pressure of captaincy, pressure of leadership is something which all of us needs to absorb. It's like a boxer. You know, you get hit, you get up, you get hit, you get up, but you still manage to get up. And you have to get up because that's what you fight for. And I think for all of us in this, in this room, or wherever we are, young, old, middle-aged, it's about getting up every time you fall, getting up every time you're pushed under pressure, and it's, it's a temperament you need to have. It's not being rude, it's not being arrogant, but it's a quiet determination from inside that every time I'm punched down, I will stand up and make things happen differently. And I think this is, this is one thing which is very important and which something which I really, really cherish in my time as captain. Hope I'm not boring all of you. Mm. Strategy. And Avik Babu has categorically mentioned, Saurav, you must speak about strategy. And uh, there's, one th there's not one thing and I, I say no to him because, you know, when, when I played cricket, I never had the opportunity of interacting with him uh, at all. I was away and always used to hear about him. But in the last six months, I've interacted with him a, a, a lot of times. And when I was driving down in the car today, I spoke to Sahi and said, you must, be, you must be fortunate enough to have a leader like that. Not that I work in his company. Not that he needs to get me a job. Uh, I see tension faces with Gotham and, and Sahi every time he walks into the room. But I must say, you're really blessed with someone who feels so good about you. And, it, and it's a characteristic of one very successful person. Not that he's going to criticize me tomorrow morning because I don't play anymore. I'm not going to nick something outside the off stump. But uh, I really admire the way you have, you have gone about your job. And I'm absolutely honored to be here speaking in front of all of you. And strategy is one of, one of his strengths. And, uh, you know, I met him a few weeks ago. He carried his tea. He still carries it. And I'm amazed that he carries a small packet of tea everywhere. And he said, Saurav, uh, what do you think that as a captain, is strategy very, very important? He's senior to me. He's elder to me. And mostly someone who I respect immensely. I had to say yes. But quietly inside, I feel that it's not just about strategy. It's about reacting to situations in, in the middle. I remember, I remember an incident, and I feel like laughing every time when I, re when I remember this. We were in Sri Lanka in, in 2000, and Sanat Jai Surya was just killing us. I remember a test match in, in Ketarama, the flattest wicket in the world, and I stood at silly point and short leg for three days. Sanat Jai Surya scored 300, and uh, Roshan Mahanama scored 250. 
We got 660 declared on the first innings. I didn't get a run. Sachin got 100. Rahul got 100. Siddhu got 100. Now when Sri Lanka batted, opener Jai Surya got a triple 100. Number three, Mahanama got a double 100. Arvind De Silva came at four and got a 100. Jai Wardhan got a 90. And when I looked at the scoreboard, 100, 100, 100, Ganguly zero. <laughs> and I had to stand three days at Silly Point and shot like. Every time Jai Surya would sweep, I would do this. One would go through my leg or my side. Luckily, I didn't manage to get hit. And I would go and say to Rahul, Mike, you got 100. Stand at Short Lake for a while. I'll stand at Silly Point because he just kept sweeping. And we used to sit in the evenings in that hotel in Taj, uh, in, in Colombo, Taj Samudra, which Gautam and Sahi know at the back of their hands, every room, how to get to the captain. If the captain's not there, how do you get to the manager? Which lift takes which floor? Which exit takes which room to the manager? to get their news. So you can hear him trade secrets, he says. But that was the truth. And, and, and you know, we, we used to sit in that hotel in, the, in front of the room, like, like or sitting on a footpath, and we used to talk about Jai Surya. One day, Venkatesh Prasad came agitated into the hall. He said, you don't have any respect for me. What's big deal about him? So what if he's getting runs? I'll get him out tomorrow. So everybody was excited. Venkatesh Prasad is going to get Jay Surya out tomorrow <laughs> because he's killed us on the trip in that hot and humid conditions of, of, of Sri Lanka. And we were excited next morning, a day-night game. We had a good sleep. And Tendulkar, every time we lost, he tried to come out as a more positive captain. And he said, Venki, OK, this time you'll not bowl one change. You'll bowl with the new ball to Jay Surya. And we strategized the entire field. We had a deep square leg, a short fine leg, mid wicket, long on, long off, no slip because hardly a delivery went behind the stumps. And Jesuria took his guard. You knew you had this. He had this habit of, you know, fixing his pads up, his thigh pads up, and before he took to bat. And we were all set that we've planned out everything for Venkatesh Prasad, and we will probably get Jesuria out for the first time cheaply. All he does, he takes card, looks up, he pitches middle and leg, he flicks it into the stands. <laughs> and I was standing at deep fine leg because being 23, 24 years old, Tendulkar thought that I was probably the best fielder in the team then. And that's why I keep saying he's not as bad as a captain as he looks. <clears throat> and <clears throat> and he made me stand at deep square leg. And all I did, I couldn't laugh because I couldn't laugh facing the bowler. I quietly saw whether the television screen was following me. <laughs> Luckily, it did not. It was following Prasad and Jay Surya because Prasad was stunned. He didn't have anything to say. For the previous two matches, he was abusing Jay Surya, and he would just sniff and hit him through the covers and point. And the cameras were on them, and I couldn't stop laughing because we spent one and a half hours talking how to get Sanat Jai Surya. And the first delivery on middle and leg, he picked it over mid-wicket or square leg halfway into the stands. And I had to go all the way through the gates to pick up the ball and throw it back for him to hit him through the offside the next time. <laughs> so at the end of the day in the evening, I went back to Sachin Tandulka. And he had this massive habit of being really, really upset when the team wouldn't play well because he would set high standards for himself, being such a great player, being such a such a champion, he believed that everyone in the team had to raise, his, raise their game to his level. And sometimes it was not possible. Everybody couldn't be a Pataudi. So everybody had to find their own way of leading and playing in the, in the team. So I went up and said, uh, Chief, he said, yes. I said, relax, uh, no, it's, been, it's been on for a month. We should be used to by now. So don't get too, so don't get too perturbed, uh, perturbed by what's happening. I have a request. He said, yeah, tell me. He said, let's play a game without team meeting. He said, why? Because I said, since the last one, we've spoken everywhere about Sanat Jai Surya. We got him out at, at Gali. We got him out at Covers. We got him out at Long On. But I think we need two more fielders, one at the point boundary on the stands that side and one on the square leg boundary on the stands that side. So if we have to get him out. And said, so let's, let's play one game without, without having any team meeting. We've been hammered on this trip. We've looked like school team. Let's just go and play. He said, fair enough. And then he banged the door, and the do not disturb uh, tag was on, 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 the, on the door. And I managed to pass on the message, because even I was getting fed up of one hour of team meeting, only tea and coffee, and then get pumped in the ground the next day. <laughs> and uh, 
So we went, and, and luckily, Sanat Jay Surya, and it's not because what I said, it's because he must have been tired of scoring runs. So he got out early the next day, and trying to hit Srinath, who I thought was a very, very good bowler. So for me, cr strategy in cricket is not the end of everything. You know, we spoke about Matthew Hayden sweeping, and he swept us one tour completely out of the game in, when, they, when they came in 2001, just sweep, sweep, and sweep. For me, a captain or a leader is, is someone who, who adjusts himself on the field, who visualizes what can happen and try and do his best. It's, a, it's an on-field job. It's something which you need to address that moment, and there is no hard and fast rule in life. I don't know what's in business. Uh, you make your plans, you make your project reports, and I don't know whether it succeeds the way you, way you want it, but in cricket, it can never be the same. So I've never been a believer of, of an Alex Ferguson sitting on the, on the fence. It can, it can work in football, but I don't think it can work in cricket. So for me, it's a sport where you have to take on-field decisions and react. It's about presence of mind. And, and I think that makes a lot of difference. It's about, it's about, in a team, it's about identifying the talent. It's about persisting with the talent. Because I'm a firm believer that you can fail, if you're good enough, you can fail for a while, you can fail for a little more, but you cannot fail forever. And I think that's one thing which I believe. So whenever, when I became captain of India, my first and foremost decision was to pick the right man. And I'm sure in your life, in corporate world, it depends on picking the right person who's going to do the job for you and, and then allow him to do everything. Give him that freedom. Because you know, a lot of, lot of players, a lot of coaches, the board or the journalists have credited me for, for, for identifying a Sehwag or a Harbhajan or a Yuvraj or a Zaheer who've gone on to play 100 games for India who've been absolute match winners for India. But to be honest, I never believed that they could play so far. I never believed that they would be successful. All I wanted to do was identify the guy and allow him to flourish. I believe that when you walk out to bat, walk out to play for India, you cannot worry about anything other than that cricket ball. If you're thinking of what your captain thinks about you, if you're thinking what the selectors thinks about you, and if you think, what if I fail? You're half the player. And for me, my tenure as captain, you call it successful or unsuccessful or averagely successful, it's about letting people do things on their own. I never picked someone on the basis of four or five knocks and never dropped him on the basis of four or five innings because I don't think he can become a player or flourish as a player during that period or with so much pressure. So for me, that was the strategy, not just thinking where to get someone out. If I don't have the gun, how can I keep shooting bullets? So for me, the strategy was to pick the best guy at the, at, at the first instance, realize his potential, and then believe in him, because nobody knows what's going to happen in a year's time or what, what a player or a person you were appointed at the job can do. Another challenge of captaincy for me is when a captain doesn't perform. It's a job which everybody wants. It's a job in Indian cricket. Every time you see your name as captain, they say the best man in Indian cricket is the vice captain. <laughs> and every time he becomes captain, the next man, next vice captain becomes the best man in Indian cricket. So the challenges <coughs> of a captain was, was, was how he reacted to situations when he was not performing at a, as a team. Because you hear in sport, everyone says a, a captain should lead by the front. And one great commentator, one, he, was a, he was a good player, I wouldn't say a great player, and I, and I didn't agree with his thoughts and beliefs. And he would, every time a captain wouldn't do well, he would be the first person criticizing, he's not good enough, he's not leading by the front. And I never believed in that because the captain is as good as his team. Yes, he needs to perform a bit better than the rest, to make sure that he's got the respect when he speaks about <coughs> strategy, skills, management in the team. But he's human. He's someone who just cannot come out like a machine hitting balls all day. So for me, the pressure of a captain or a leader was, was when he didn't perform and play the game up to the standards expected. And, and you know, a coach, a coach in, in, in this instance is, or, or in your world, somebody who is next to you, I think he can help you. It's about, it's about getting to push him. I remember the Natwist Trophy in 2003 when 
India were playing England in the NatWest final. We had a fantastic, fantastic tournament. We didn't lose a game, but I wasn't getting much runs. Three or four games, I hadn't got runs at all. And we landed at Lords for the final. We played in Bristol a day before, and we were on the, on the M, M4, on, on the team coach. For me, that was the best journey ever I have had in sport, is to get on that bus on the motorway in England and get from one county to the other. And, uh, and I was up, up on the court sitting in the front seat and was a bit disappointed that wasn't getting runs and I realized that this was a final where I needed to play well, where I needed to get runs because we wanted to win at Lords. And we came to London, uh, John Wright said, we need, we go to practice tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock and uh, three o'clock, we leave, the bus leaves at three and, and we'll start training at four. So I get onto the bus and the first thing he says, you have a press conference to attend at, at quarter to four. So you attend that and you come back into the nets. So I said, fine, coach, that's what if you mean, I'll do it. So I, we landed up at Lord's at the back end nursery, nursery ground, and I was invariably at the press conference. And then when you enter a press conference, the questions doesn't seem to end. So you keep answering, keep answering, and invariably you get late. And uh, I walk back into the, into the practice arena, and, and I see three pairs have already batted, and John fuming. When John Wright gets, is under pressure, uh, the casualty is the freezer, is the freezer in the dressing room. He would open it, take a bottle of water, half the time drink a sip and throw it away, half the time not drink it. And you could see that he was under pressure. So he walks up to me and says, you don't need to bat. I'm not, I'm not going to let you bat in the nets. I said, uh, John, I'm not scoring runs. I'm, I'm not in a good frame of mind. I need a hit. I need a hit. I need to bat. I cannot go to bed waking up tomorrow morning for a final with the mindset I had in the previous game where I got nicked off by Lasit Malinga. And uh, he said, no, you're not batting because you're the captain, you're never on time. I said, never on time? You asked me to go and do the press conference and you shouldn't have asked me to do the press conference. So we ha had a heated exchange for about a good 10, 15 minutes. And then I told him, do you realize I'm your captain? He said, yes, so what? I said, I'm more important than you are. <laughs> he said, so may be it, and I don't want to see, in see you in the nets. I then listened to him, I padded up, and I went and padded. I saw him fuming, and the practice got over, and he didn't speak to me. He said, I'm never going to speak to you again. If we don't win tomorrow, you, either you go or I go. I said, you go, I don't go. <laughs> so then I tried the same thing with Greg Chapel, and, and, and I went the next time. <laughs> so, so, so he said, so he said, hope I'm not being too long, and you have because Avik Babu has organized a fantastic dinner after this. I'll take a little more, a few more minutes. And, uh, and he said that uh, uh, it's the end of uh, your and my relationship. And uh, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. He was a mild man and one of the loveliest persons I've ever met. So we didn't speak. We went back to the Lord's dressing room. I had my name up on the board. Uh, my first test 100 at Lord's, so I quietly went and watched that for a minute. So he watched me doing all this because, you know, you feel good when you get 100 in a ground and then go back and play there again. So I said, let's have a meeting here and uh, it's going to be late. Go and rest. We've got a final to play tomorrow. It's a day game, 11 o'clock start in England, so you leave at 9 in the morning. We just played a game day before yesterday and we did a team meeting and, uh, and I finished my team meeting, announced the team, didn't even ask the coach. I've never done it in my life. I said, Saurav Ganguly, if you lose tomorrow, uh, you had it. And uh, I announced it, and uh, we left. Everybody packed their bags and left. Everybody wanted to go out for a meal in London. And John was sitting in that corner waiting to speak, and everybody left. So I, I, I asked him. I didn't, I didn't want to ask him, and I, and, I asked, and I told the dressing room attendant. I said, uh, you can please make sure that the door's locked and make sure that our bags are safe. He said, yeah, yeah, Lord's everything is safe, so don't worry. He was trying to tell John Wright, come on, let's leave. And we left, we went back, we came back next day. England got 325. And I walked back into the, into the lunchtime, up that long room, up the stairs into my dressing room, thinking, sort of Ganguly, it's your last day as captain. Either you win it because you've annoyed the coach, I know a long report is going to go. I don't know whether it's going to be effective or not. I never knew reports were so effective since 2006. And, uh, and, I, and uh, I went up to Virendra Sehwag and said, Viru, we need to do something different. He was whistling away. <laughs> and like, he said, listen, I'm talking to you. We need, we need to have a good start. 
we need to get to 100 in first 15 overs, not with too many wickets, and then we'll see what happens. He said, yes, Kip, don't worry. So we got off to a good start, and, uh, and, and we were 100 in the first 14 overs when I got out getting a 60 of 30-odd deliveries. I went up to Virinder Sevag in one over. He was sweeping uh, Ronnie Irani from outside the off stunt. He just swept him for a four, and I went up to him and said, Viru, don't do this. We are in a good position. We don't want to lose wickets. He said, yeah, don't worry, Skip, I will not do it. The next ball, he played a reverse sweep on the offside. <laughs> and I wanted to go up to him, and I said, leave it. Uh, you're not doing your job as a captain, and they don't listen to you either. So why do you need to go? Just play. And uh, we finished the game. India won. Uh, in, the, in the second last over, KF and Yuvaraj's brilliance. And, and then I came back to the dressing room in the evening, and John Wright was there having a beer. <laughs> and he came up to me with his smile, and I said, just get lost. Uh, he said, hey, listen, I did this to get you going. <laughs> uh, I said, okay. Uh, now you're saying that uh, you did this to get me going. What happened if you would have lost? No, no, I would have still come and hugged you and, and, and said, well, then I said, bet you won't. You would have written to the board to get someone as captain who would have listened to you. The reason why I tell this is that sometimes as a leader, as a captain, you have to bear the brunt. You have to compartmentalize your job as a batsman and a captain. The biggest challenge you face when you're captain of a team, and it has happened to Indian cricket a lot of times, you walk out to bat at number five, you see the scoreboard, 60 for three, and the opposition has got 400. Now, the decision you have to make is that whether you, you look at the scoreboard or you whether decide to play your own innings. Invariably, you look at the scoreboard, you will get out because the pressure of the scoreboard is going to kill you. And for me, this is the biggest challenge of a leader is to separate your role <coughs> as a captain and as a player. It's, it's a hard thing to do. It's the toughest thing to do in Indian sport with everyone criticizing. But it's the best thing to do if you have to survive at the top for a long, long period. When you, when you bat, you bat as a batsman. And then once that's over, you come back to the dressing room when you walk out to field. You believe you are the captain of India and do your duties as a captain of India. That's the only way you will survive and succeed at the top level. Shelf life of a captain. I wish everyone had a self-life like Graham Smith, 100 test matches as captain. And I was coming down in the car, and once again, Sahi, he's become very popular in my speech. He asked me, what do you have to say about Graham Smith? Does every captain have a shelf life? I'm sure he was <clears throat> you know, told by Avik Babu that shelf life is important in every aspect of life. <clears throat> for, for me, a shelf life of a captain depends on an individual. You can go on and on. And for me, it's never over in life, whatever you do whether you're a player, whether you're a corporate leader, whether you're a captain. It's never over for anything, whether you sell peanuts on the roadside. For me, it's an opportunity every day to become a hero, <clears throat> to reinvent yourself. And, and it's about just how you perceive yourself. It's about, it's about believing that it's too much, and I'm answerable, I'm under the pump all the time, being criticized or it's about trying to reinvent yourself and say, I've got something more. You know, Shah Rukh Khan once told me, and this is something which has, which has really, really gone into my heart and soul. He said, Saurav, uh, in the year 2008, when he still had me as captain of Knight Riders, he said in 2008, you know, Saurav, uh, I came into this industry as someone who was not good-looking, as someone who couldn't dance. He I was not as good-looking as Rithik Roshan or or a Saif Ali Khan, or a Namita Bachchan, as gifted as he is. But I would wake up every morning, stand in front of the mirror, and say I'm the best. He said, I did that every day of my life till I became Shah Rukh Khan. I don't know whether he said the truth or not, but uh, he said that to me, and I, and I felt, geez, this can have an effect. You know, you wake up every morning of your life, before you go to work, before you go to play, before you go to shoot, before you do something which is a high pressure where you have to deliver as otherwise somebody else gets the job. It's about waking up every morning and thinking I'm the best and I can deliver. And for me, your shelf life, how long you lead, how long you survive in your profession depends on that. How much you want it, how much you're ready to rediscover, and how much you're ready to wake up in the morning and say I'm the best and I'll do my best today. I think I've spoken for a long time. 
I, was, I, I wanted to speak to you about life after cricket, but I think that's going to take you till late in the evening. But I hope I have been able to say what I wanted to say. Uh, once again, Avik Babu, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to talk in front of all of you. And uh, it's a very, very proud moment. And, and, and it's, it's in the memory of a, of a wonderful, wonderful person, Mansur Ali Khan Patauri. And you know, I must bring to your notice one thing which has is, which is really, really touched me is his beautiful wife, Sharmila Tagore. You know, I released a book. I released a book six months ago six months ago, which he, which he released herself about her husband. And I think it's, a, it's an inspiration to all ladies who fire husbands every day, <laughs> including mine, uh, where everything your husband does is wrong. You know, she took the trouble of, of requesting each and every one of his colleagues, the great Bishan Singh Bedi, Imran Khan, Ian Chappell, and the whole lot of big names in that book, to write a book on, on Mansur Ali Khan Padawdi. And, you know, when I came to the launch of the book six months ago, I was really, really touched by what she did for her husband, even after he's no more. She is of a fantastic family, a very well-known family. Mansur Ali Khan Padawdi, Sharmila Tagore, Saif Ali Khan, Kareena Kapoor Khan, although I still believe she's the best looking of all of them still. And uh, <clears throat> to see so much of love and affection for your husband was really, really heartening. And I must say that uh, you've really taught me something on that day, and I'll cherish that always in my life. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for bearing with me. that marvelous speech, it's quite difficult to be equally eloquent about so many things as Saurabh was. And uh, this is the third edition. This is that wonderful time of the year again, this uh, Tiger Memorial Lecture. And it's the third year, and the time has gone so quickly. And uh, I think Telegraph and uh, Bengal Club were the first one to institute uh, a lecture in Tiger's memory, much before BCCI did. So I think I'm, that, is, that was really very special what you did, Abhik. And thank you so much for all of you for coming here today and always supporting this, uh, this lecture, which is, as Abhik said, has become very, very special. And of course, Saurav, I mean, what can I say? I think many of us uh, have been here for all three lectures. And I think I speak on everybody's behalf when I say that this lecture has been most instructive and eloquent, of course, and inspirational and very, very entertaining. And of course, discerning and not, I mean, obviously you said such nice things about me, so I have to <laughs> say, say this. And I think all of us will go back with the messages that you have given us about team, trust, transparency, strategy, and leadership. I think you spoke extremely well, and uh, most certainly it has uh, found a lot of resonance with me, and I have learned a lot. Thank you.